I mean, I'm only a bit of a loser. I'm not a massive loser. Hello everybody, welcome back. It's your boy with the blaze. My name is Simon, wearing a business blazer, and this episode of Business Blaze is brought to you by Backblaze. I'm not even joking. Let me see, let me see what Backblaze have to say. Get a 15 day free trial at backblaze.com forward slash blaze. Backblaze.com forward slash blaze. I feel like that is the best short link that I've ever had. I asked if I could have backblaze.com forward slash allegedly and they said no. Oh, more on them in a bit. This is funny Amazon reviews. This has got to be one of the most requested things that I, I think we've brought up Amazon reviews and people like a couple of times are like ridiculous reviews and people are like, Simon, just, just pull out the Amazon reviews and read them. I was like, well, that sounds really lazy. So I got Danny to write me a script about bad Amazon reviews. So let's see what he's done for us. Here uh, on Business Blaze, uh, Danny writes this. I read it. I've never read this before. I make some hopefully hilarious comments, and then Sam adds some memes. Let's crack on. Occasionally that happens. Way back in the ancient mists of time, before the internet came along and turned the entire population of Earth into armchair critics and keyboard warriors, smash that dislike button, get involved in the comments. I want to know what you think about... Not really, I don't. Uh, it could be quite tricky to get an informed opinion of a product that had tickled your interest. Outside, unless that product is Backblaze. Uh, outside of your close circle of friends and family, you usually had to flick through your newspaper columns and specialist magazines to check out if the latest album from, oh my God, Kajagoogoo? What the f is that? Danny, what is this? Kajagoogoo was good or not, the newfangled fax machine was really going to be worth the $20,000 price tag. Spoiler alert. I mean, if you're a lawyer and shit back in the day, you're probably like, oh my god, yes, it's a revolution. Everyone else is like, no, no. Oh, I should also point out that this is actually part one. Danny made this script 20 pages long. So I split it into two parts because reasons. But even the professional critics were often close to bloody useless. In 1969 in the UK, the newspaper Melody Maker published a front page review of the new record from John Lennon and Yoko Ono. Oh no. Ah! That's actually my cover of Yoko Ono's music. Um, let me show you another track she did. Ah! It's good, right? Uh, it's just... Brilliant music. Uh, it was called The Wedding Album. There was another one. This was another one of their experimental pieces, half of which just involved the two boundary-breaking artists saying each other's name over and over again. Ugh. I have never heard of this. There's a good reason. I just die a little inside. Sam, I wish we could play it, but uh, absolutely, if we do, John Lennon's estate or... Yoko Ono, don't play it because I'll just get claimed the shit out of it and I don't want them to get any more money than is absolutely necessary. Richard Williams was the Melody Maker critic who'd been assigned the challenging task of reviewing this deeply odd album. It's not challenging, Richard. Just bit, just say, I just had the opportunity to listen to the wedding album from John Loco, John and Yoko. It was a bit shit. There you go, Richard. Do I have to do everyone's job for them? For some odd reason, the promotional copy that he received contained two single-sided vinyl records. One side of each disc was effectively blank, featuring nothing more than the engineer's test signal. I can see where this is going. But poor Richard Williams assumed that he was reviewing a double album and ended up reviewing the whole thing in glorious detail. And just to make matters worse, he seemed more impressed with the engineer's test signal than he did with anything that John and Yoko had bothered to record. That's because their music is shit. Imagine all the people stop imagining and start like organizing some peace conference or something for fuck's sake, John. <sighs> Jesus Christ. We're, we're not even halfway through page one. I'm already ranting pretty fucking hard. Hippies, they're everywhere. They want to save the earth, but all they do is smoke pot and smell bad. He wrote, sides two and four consist entirely of single tones maintained throughout, presumably produced electronically. This might sound arid to say the least, but in fact, constant listening reveals a curious point. The pitch of the tones alter frequently, but only by microtones, or at most, a semitone. This oscillation produces an almost subliminal, uneven beat, which maintains interest. Oh no, it's like the wine critics who've, who's been served like some super cheap wine and told it's expensive, and he's 
like, oh yes, I can really take the taste of the oakiness. <laughs> it's the constant listening bit that worries me. Just how many times did he sit through the test signal to form this opinion? John Lennon saw the funny side, even though Richard Williams had largely slagged off the real parts of the album. The former Beatles sent a telegram to Williams, which read, We both feel that this is the first time a critic topped the artist. We are not joking. Love and peace, John and Yoko. I just, it's just a bit shit, isn't it? Fortunately, we no longer have to rely on just the scribblings of professional journalists reviewing the wrong half of the product. Nowadays, a typical online shopping trip to Amazon will throw up dozens of insightful and considered evaluations on absolutely any old shit. Whether you're checking out a pickle-flavored lip balm, I don't know how I feel about that, an inflatable unicorn horn for cats, a bacon-scented fake mustache, or a Godzilla garden gnome. I know Danny, he's not making these up. These are products. You can usually pull up a long list of reviews which convey the heartiest opinions of the people that really matter, the everyday man or woman on the street. Uh, yeah, people like, if anyone else listened to John and Yoko's wedding album, they'd just be like, it's a bit shit, isn't it? <laughs> uh, people like me and Simon. Who? Oh, everyday people on the street. Well, me anyway. <laughs> of course, some reviews are slightly more helpful than others. And you can't help but notice that not every reviewer seems to be taking their civic duty entirely seriously. And I think that's what this video is all about. If you're watching this and you're like seven minutes in, you're like, Get to the f***ing point, Englishman. In fact, some of them are downright taking the piss. As I've now been spending several weeks in virus lockdown in the UK, and all the pubs are still not bloody open. Oh, the pubs opened on Monday here. It's the 27th of May. Two days ago they opened. It's glorious. <laughs> oh, I go to the pub after work today for the second time this week. And it's Wednesday. <laughs> Uh, I've been having to constantly find new and exciting ways to occupy my time indoors and avoid writing the next business plays script. Yeah, Danny, I can tell. We're behind schedule. What? Ah! I'm sorry, Simon! What? I mean master! So I've been placing a fair amount of Amazon orders on books and games and things that might help keep my mind busy during lockdown. And thank goodness for those Amazon reviews that often helped me to avoid wasting good money on products that don't live up to the description. I've recently finished plowing my way through the entire published works of Donald Trump. Lucky you, Danny. He didn't write any of it, as we've discussed previously. Allegedly. And I decided it might be time to buy a new book that was along the same sort of lines. So, my attention was immediately drawn to the Lift the Flat book for kids called Where is Baby's Belly Button by Karen Katz. I'll give you a fuck clue, Karen. Mmm. Uh, okay, I've got a picture here. Um, Sam, do the honors. Well, the first most f***ing obvious thing <laughs> is it's clearly visible on the cover. Thankfully, I spotted a review by a guy called Pac-Man who was quick to point out the major flaw in this piece of work. You can see the ending right on the cover. It's right there. The book is completely misleading. The entire plot revolves around finding baby's belly button and the, t the title makes this much clear from the beginning. However, there is no mystery. There is no twist. Baby's belly button is right where it's supposed to be, on baby's stomach. Right where it clearly shows you on the cover of the book. Oh, books for kids are so shit. Like, I've got a kid who's like six months old. The kids' books are so shit. <laughs> like, one of them is just black and white pictures of animals. And I've, I'm so bored with this. I've started rating their levels of danger. So it's like, it's a book for kids, but you know, there's a picture of like a fox and I'm like, well, as a baby, I'd say a fox presents a level of danger eight to you. But as an adult man, a fox is a level of danger one. And then there's like a fucking wolf. And I'm like, that's a fucking 10. Like, why are you showing this baby? It's like, and then there's a brown bear. I mean, I'm assuming it's brown because it, I don't know, it looks like it would be brown, but it's black and white because apparently babies can only see black and white. Anyway, so I've just started rating the danger of the animals because I'm so bored. <laughs> there is no conflict. There is no character development. And there is scarcely any plot. Whoever wrote this book must have made a serious error in judgment because you would have to be an infant not to immediately understand where baby's belly button is. This is one of the worst pieces of literature I've ever read. I agree, Pac-Man. I mean, it's right there. <laughs> <laughs> An alternative literary opinion that I had ultimately found far more appealing was crafting with cat hair. Cute handicrafts to make with your cat. Kaori Tsutaya. 
Okay, wait, is this actually made with, you're making things with the hair of cats? Because then it says, things to make with your cat, which implies that you're doing the making. Uh, sorry, there's an image there. Uh, it, it says, craft handicrafts, cute handicrafts to make with your cat. If it was made with hair, wouldn't it be with your cat's hair? Because, I mean, the cat's probably not doing a fuck all. Cats are lazy and they don't have opposable thumbs. I don't actually have a cat, but I figured that I could check out this book first and see if it was worth getting one on the strengths of the crafting projects that I could potentially put together with lumps of shedding cat hair. Oh, so you really are making things with cat hair. That strikes me as a bit weird. Like, <laughs> let's not do that. Let's just not do that as people. The official press review sounded faintly positive. It caught our attention, claims the Huffington Post. It caught our attention sounds like one of those things that you know is neither good or bad. The Holocaust caught our attention. Uh, you know, also can be positive, like the delicious ice cream caught our attention. It's, it's neutral, if anything. But the reviews that also, why the f is the Huffington Post reviewing this book? But the review that sealed the deal for me turned out to be quite topical in a way, even though it was written a few years ago, long before the dawn of the virus. Useful information there. Rico said, I purchased this book when I was, oh, I see why he's mentioned this. I purchased this book as I was tired of people sitting too close to me on public transport. It worked like a charm. I can, you can, you can imagine the person who has this book, right? It's like some weird old lady with 17 cats and no life. So I'm a don't discriminate against weird old ladies with cat 17 cats and no life. I figured I might also need a little something more highbrow, so I was delighted when I came across a book called A Million Random Digits with 100,000 normal deviates. I don't know what a deviate is, normal deviate is. It's because I didn't pay attention in maths class. Originally published. Also, you know all that shit you learn in math? I know this is not the time to bring this up and I really should talk about today's sponsor Backblaze at some point. You know when they tell you, you know, like in maths at school, you're like, yeah, yeah, you really have to learn this trigonometry stuff so you can work out the height of buildings. And I'm like, and as a kid, I was like, yeah, I guess so. And then there was the other one, you know, you won't have a calculator in your pocket. Well, you obviously will, that joke's been made a million times. But also other ones, like, uh, what's that thing called where you have like two equations and then you have to like combine them into one equation? That's sh complicated and I have no idea why I had to learn that. <laughs> it's like actual times that I've brought two equations together after learning how to do that is absolutely fucking zero. <laughs> the only time that that has ever served me until this point, since 20 years ago when I learned that, is making a, 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 an anecdote in a Business Plays episode and getting paid for it. So, fuck you, science! Originally published in 1955, this 400 page book contains 50 lines of 50 random numbers on every page. It was once hailed as an important 20th century work in the field of statistics and random numbers, and was apparently very popular with scientists and boffins in need of ready made tables of pseudo random numbers. Why are they pseudo random? They should definitely not be pseudo random, they should be random. Also, I do think this is a thing because, oh, I'm sure they're gonna get to this, because you do need, like, it's very hard to come up with random before computers, obviously, before, tr with truly random stuff. The 2001 reissue of the book didn't seem entirely necessary, though, because, you know, computers and shit. <laughs> so true! D. Ringer had issues with the title of the book. A million random digits? Ha, huh, they only use 10, and just get repeating them in different combinations. Don't be fooled. <laughs> Another customer dropped a big spoiler alert. They just pretty much stay random the whole time. I mean, if you've seen one random number, you've seen them all. In a, in a slap in the face of randomness, the very randomness of it gets repetitive after a few pages. Save yourself the time, and if you need a random number, just sort of think of a random number in your head and write it down. It's like thinking of a random number. One. Done. Odds are, it's in the book already, and you just saved yourself $80. $80?! In fact, the spoilers were flying thick and fast. Another more positive reviewer wrote, it ends on 41998. You should read it anyway, as you'll never guess how you get there. You won't, because it's completely random. But Logan Chappie Alamos lamented, they sure don't come up with random numbers like they used to. Interesting, the reissue of the book must have generated some reasonable sales numbers, as it spawned a follow-up, a million random digits, the sequel, with perfectly uniform distribution. It's just a joke though, right? Anyway, uh, I think that's a break. Let's uh, use this opportunity to talk about the absolute legends that are Backblaze. And any, on it, honestly, any company that's like, yeah, yeah, I'll sponsor Business Blaze, is either brave or has never watched my videos. But that's why we have Backblaze. Um, I'm just gonna actually just read these 
and riff on them. The best way to back up all of your files is with Backblaze. Uh, as you guys know, I like to try all the sponsors I have on the show. I'm not even joking about, I mean, I do pretty much try all the sponsors. I couldn't try the wine one. <laughs> we have a wine sponsor. And to my great disappointment, they couldn't ship to me because I live in Europe. And there are like laws. So I'm like, oh, lame. But uh, I've been using, I used Backblaze long before actually they sponsored this. Um, I have lots of data. In fact, I mentioned how much I back up with Backblaze once and they were like, please don't mention that exact number because it's really large because their backup is unlimited. And uh, I really take advantage of that. So right now what happens is like, as this video is being recorded, it's going to my computer and that file is being synced securely with a military grade encryption or whatever. I mean, just, you know, it's not gonna happen. No one's gonna unencrypt that shit, except for me. And then that's going off to Backblaze's servers where all of that data is backed up. I don't have backups, like, that I have to bother with. Like, there's no extra hard disks, there's no extra copies, there's no, like, Blu-ray disks burned with, like, old files, which would be insane because I'd be burning, like, two a day. It's all just synced to Backblaze's servers. I never even worry about it. Sometimes I'm like, just gonna check that shit working. And I open up the Backblaze control panel and it's like, hey, yeah, you've got all your data backed up. Don't even worry about it. I'm like, okay, cool, thanks, Backblaze. Cool, 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 cool. And uh, I'm really not on these talking points, am I? I'm sure there's things I'm supposed to be saying. Secure, unlimited, yes. Um, it provides peace of mind. Obviously it does. That's kind of the best thing about it. Like, you don't have to worry about it. And they take care of it all for you. It is glorious. Uh, there's a 15-day free trial you guys can take advantage of. Just go to backblaze.com forward slash blaze. Backblaze.com forward slash blaze. Appropriate. And you'll get a 15-day free trial. And that's a really good way to try it out. I mean, and let, for me, I'd need more than 15 days to back up all of my files because I've got so many. But that's going to be plenty for you. You'll see how easy it is to use. And when you want a file, if like, you have some, like, I don't know, your computer blows up or whatever, or it gets nicked, you can just go onto Backblaze and be like, all right, well, I need to download all my files. And if you're like me, if it's like an <laughs> absolute metric ton of files, they can ship you out a hard disk, which is uh, honestly pretty epic. It's also crazy cheap. The price isn't in here. I think it's like $6 a month or something. Maybe I shouldn't mention that because they don't put it in the talking points. But I don't know. I think I get billed once a year. It's like $60. <laughs> I'm like, okay. I mean, I'm sure I could ask for it for free because they sponsor our videos. But I'm like, it's so cheap. I don't even care. It is absolutely glorious. Peace of mind. Backblaze. 15 day free trial. Backblaze.com forward slash blaze. And look, I don't know how many sponsors are going to support Business Blaze because, you know, it's a little bit crazy. Support Backblaze. Go sign up. Get that free trial because it really honestly does support the show and it keeps me making more sh** and uh, I'd like it if you did that. So uh, thank you very much, and thank you to Backblaze for being absolute legends and supporting this show. But if there was an Amazon review about Backblaze, it wouldn't be sarcastic, it would be awesome. I'm often on the lookout for useful self-help books, and one intriguing title that caught my eye was How to Avoid Huge Ships. Oh, I've heard of this. <laughs> By Master Mariner and Seattle Harbor Pilot, Captain John W. Trimmer. Okay, I think I've got an image right here. How to Avoid Huge Ships. When Danny first made this for me, all of these images were massive. And I was like, Danny, why did you make all the images so massive? Now I have to go through and shrink them down. I mean, I don't, but I, I didn't want to waste. How to avoid huge ships. Here it is in all its glory. I mean, I assumed that this must be like fictional. Like, you know, these weird books that have weird titles. And it's like, you know, it's not actually about how to avoid huge ships. It's about, you know, the struggle of poverty in like 1930s New York City or something like that, you know? Um, it's just randomly titled. Anyway, uh, let's move on because I'm just talking shit. Reviewer David O'Leary was able to offer some further, not entirely genuine, background to the author of this tome. This book is the better known effort by Captain Trimmer, who also wrote the earlier, similarly styled, How to Park Your Aircraft Carrier and Sticking Your Head in the Microwave, A Cautionary Tale. <laughs> the book may have a slightly bewildering title, but it was actually intended to offer genuine, expert advice to private owners of yachts and small boats on how to avoid accidental or collisions with much bigger ships. But I suspect not all of the re reviewers were salty sea dogs. Also, like, how to avoid huge ships? It's like, I don't know, go around it. It's a huge ship. Like, I've sailed, I used to sail, and it's like, when there's a boat that's bigger than you, you go around it. If the boat is smaller than you, it goes around you. <laughs> I mean, that's not really how it works. There's like sailing rules and stuff, but like, you're not gonna get like a container ship to give way to you. You know, it's just, you know, it's like, hey, it's my right away. They, they don't, no, no. Uh, Dan wrote, I read this book before going on vacation and I couldn't find my cruise liner in the port. <laughs> vacation ruins. Uh, meanwhile, Darren Moran complains that he stumbled across this while looking for, for books on how to attract huge ships. 
<laughs> this book is awful and vaguely racist. How is it vaguely racist? I must be missing a joke. Oh no. One reviewer had got the wrong idea entirely and was so every time I miss a joke or one of Danny's puns, everyone's like, oh, Simon, you missed the joke, you dumb dumb. And I'm like, it's probably true. One reviewer had got the wrong idea entirely and was sorely disappointed. As an individual plagued with chronic constipation and bowel distress for most of my adult life, I felt that my prayers had finally been answered by Captain Trimmer's bold and succinct title. <laughs> He's misread it. But there's a huge boat on the front, so I mean, uh, you can imagine my disappointment when I realized that once again my dyslexia had let me down. Cooper claims that the third chapter in the book, Relocation to Arizona, had proven to be particularly helpful, while Chim Bilgrim came up with some of his own advice for free. My, my advice to beginners who want to avoid huge ships is stay on land. Oh! Make sure there is land completely everywhere around you. This works. I've tried it many times. When you are sure you're good at this, you can gradually approach the coast and do some of the more advanced stuff. I fucking love this sarcasm. It's absolutely gold. Further, browsing through the book titles on Amazon dished up possibly the saddest book you're ever likely to see in your life. Microwave for One by Sonia Allison. I've seen this book. You guys have seen this book. I mean, this has been published on... I feel like I've seen this on Reddit like 17 times as like, you know, forever alone meme. You wonder how the author managed to fill up 144 pages with microwave for one, one recipes, but to be fair, it was first published back in 1987 when microwaves were still a relatively new appliance in the average kitchen. I have to say, like, I don't know, there are, you know, as a student or whatever, when I just lived with my friends, we didn't cook together, like, every day. I didn't want to cook every day. I couldn't afford to have takeout every day, so I'd be like, yeah, I'm just gonna microwave some... I mean, I guess she's talking more advanced shit than, like, throwing, like, a Chicago town. Is that what they are? One of those little mini pizzas that cost like you could get two for 99p from Iceland. Chicago town, something like that. And they'd absolutely just, you'd put them in the microwave. You'd microwave them for like three minutes. It would melt all the cheese and they'd absolutely nuke the top of your mouth if you ate it too quickly. But I mean, I would have had microwave for one at one point in my life. And I don't feel like, I mean, I'm only a bit of a loser. I'm not a massive loser. Back then, I only knew one mate whose family had one and his dad also had a yacht on the drive. Oh my God, what, what about the guy who's been trying to avoid huge boats? He didn't think about boats, you know, on trailers. Years later, the book still seems to be providing comfort and radiating electromagnetic warmth into the lives of many Amazon shoppers. But a bum bum. Michael Pamulis wrote, it used to be that I got home from work and the only thing I'd once put in my mouth was the cold barrel of my grandfather's shotgun. Oh, that's the best one so far. Then I discovered Sonia Allison's chicken tetrazzini and now there are two things, you sad bastards. And I love how descriptive he is. Just like how it's his grandfather's and it's cold. Oh! Christopher Brandon Sheik revealed that before he bought the book, preparing food was a long and tedious task. Now I prepare delicious meals for myself in no time at all. So far. It sounds like a genuine review. Then I take my grandfather's shotgun out. I now have much more time to get drunk and curse my ex and weep uncontrollably in a corner. This is good, but it's somehow less funny because of the absolute brutality of the previous one. Mr. Nowhere explained that the book has made an impact on his life. I just went through a down period during which I soaked up old food stains from my kitchen floor with a sponge, squeezed them into a cup of water, and ate the result as a cold soup. That is not right. I discovered this book and realized that I could heat up the food state soup in the microwave. It has made a great difference to my quality of life. But Stephen Kazenewski pointed out that some of the advice in the book bordered slightly on the vague and undercooked side. He claimed in jest, I hope, that the book contained such lines as, if beans explode out of the back of the frozen burrito, it's probably done. If you're making something with like marinara sauce, make sure you put a paper towel over it. If it seems as if it's not quite cooked, just put it back in for another 30 seconds or whatever. That's the truth with microwaves. It's like, I have no idea if this is cooked. Absolutely no idea. Let's do another 30 seconds. <laughs> hope for the best. It should come as no surprise that the biggest selling book of all time has attracted some rather odd reviews over the years. I'm of course talking about THE book, the only book to have sold over 5 billion copies worldwide since it was first published, The Art of the Deal by Donald Trump. No wait, that's the wrong book. I meant to say the Bible. The Bible sold 5 billion copies. People have two, two, two copies. Although to be fair, I've probably bought like at least three Bibles or four Bibles in my life because 
I unfortunately went to a religious school and, uh, you know, the Bible is like the textbook for RE class, religious education class, and uh, which, you know, it was very Christian focused. <laughs> like religious education, we're just going to focus on the Bible and less on, you know, on all of the other books <laughs> and religions. So I probably bought five of them because, I don't know, I've probably thrown, I threw it at my friend once or twice and then he threw it in a lake or some shit. I feel like this must have legitimately happened because we'd throw Bibles at each other because they're really big. And, you know, the teacher would get out of the class and say, he'd be like, BOOM! <laughs> so, ah! Oh, I got hit with a Bible! Now stand aside, worthy adversary. Tis but a scratch. And then it was, uh, you know, um, the windows, you know, in the summer would be open. Then you'd just be like, hey, John! Mm. Just throw his Bible out the window and then it would like get f***ed up in a bush or something. So John would have to new get a new Bible. Then John would throw my Bible out of the window. And then it'd be like, ah, oh, f***. And we're all buying new Bibles. So uh, that's a long reason why there have been 5 billion Bibles bought. School kids throwing Bibles at each other. Oh my god, people are going to have to smash that dislike button so hard for this video. Uh, the King James Version of the Bible has generated hundreds of tongue-in-cheek reviews on Amazon, though sadly many of them have been deleted. That sounds like censoring free speech to me. Outrageous! Get Brian Rose on this. <laughs> However, I've still managed to dig up a few gems that were apparently deemed too controversial for Jeff Bezos to handle, possibly because he was a bit scared of being hit by a giant thunderbolt from the sky. Oh, Jesus, if Jeff's scared, I'm not because it's not real. <laughs> w. Christian wrote, <clears throat> he didn't write that. For those of you who don't know, this is God's second novel after the Old Testament. It's a marked improvement in my opinion. He got rid of a lot of the previous angst and scorn. And it's really... <laughs> the Old Testament's a bit emo. <laughs> and has really began to show the maturity present in his later works. He's become a more loving and kind God. And noticeably, he doesn't throw nearly as many tantrums as he does in the first book. It's true. Snippets from the other, other band reviews include... Still scratching my head over this one. It starts with the story of a talking snake and ends with a story about a seven-headed dragon. In the middle, there were stories about swarms of frogs, lice, locusts and flies, and bears eating kids. Shit. I feel like I just read all the non-cool parts of the Bible. A giant fish ate a guy at one point. Oh yeah, I know that story. There was this guy who made a big boat and filled it with all kinds of animals and then floated around for a while following birds. <laughs> okay. Even though there was some sex, murder and magic in it, it was overall a weird, disappointing rambling book that <laughs> didn't make much sense. One of the first characters was a talking snake, who I found quite interesting. Then the story talked about silly people and quickly became tedious. I jumped to the end to see if there was any more about this snake. No. There was a kind of dragon, but it didn't talk. And one reviewer finally felt compelled to, pe to return his damaged copy. This book is faulty. It doesn't work when I pray for an Audi R8. I tried to pray for something less expensive and it still doesn't show up in front of me. If people can part seas with prayers, then I should be at least able to get some ice cream. Yeah, no, I mean, religion's a bit weird, right? Because you're like, well, I tried all the things it mentions and none of it worked. But I guess I still believe. Uh, I suppose I should feel fortunate that I've not had to entertain or educate any kids during the lockdown period. Some of my mates with children suddenly seem to have gradually developed a newfound respect for teachers, which is now bordering on cult worship of superhuman beings. Still... <laughs> It's like, oh my god, taking care of kids is hard. I'm glad someone else does that for me. Still, it shouldn't have been too difficult to find something on Amazon that might have kept them quiet whenever I was busy rearranging my novelty paperclip collection. Important things, Danny. I'm not sure if Yellies would have been the answer, though. These cute, furry spider toys are voice activated. That sounds creepy as fuck. So the idea is that the louder you scream at them, the faster they scuttle towards you. Who invented this? It's scary. Not all, I'm not even scared of spiders and that shit sounds scary. Uh, not all parents were impressed by the concept. Tish wrote, I've been looking for something to make my kids play louder. <laughs> Said no parent ever. So like my six month old kid is like, oh yeah, I'd like, I'd really like it if you could cry louder, please. That would be perfect. I'm so glad they have a toy that you now have to yell at. My kids are so well behaved, they definitely won't decide to play with these at 3am. Great invention, guys. Larry uh, Lacey Elmuth had 80 ha eight handy words of advice. 
buy this if you hate someone with kids. Incidentally, if you were thinking of buying one of these for your own kids, it's probably best to check out that they're not shit scared of spiders first. One troubled parent recalled on Facebook how she bought one for her son, Leo, who screamed in terror at the sight of the furry spider and tried desperately to run away from it. The problem is that the toy is designed to feed off the screams of his terror. It's true. It's like, why you scream at it and it comes towards you? What the fuck? So the louder he yelled, the faster the toy spider chased him all around the house. Poor Leo may have been better off with one of those cabbage patch snack time dolls that just eat your hair and fingers. Oh yeah, that's an OG business plays legend joke. Uh, this is where we're taking a break on Amazon reviews because it's 20 pages long. Uh, guys, smash that like button. Smash that dislike button because I'm sure I've upset some people. Cool, 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 cool. In the meantime, I don't care about any of that. Look, support business uh oh my god this is tricky because they have almost the same name please don't sue me allegedly if you want to support business blaze which makes you an absolute legend backblaze.com forward slash blaze get yourself that 15 day free trial i think you'll just like it a lot it'll make your life easier and better and more glorious and well it's better than praying that your shit gonna be okay because that's not gonna work thank you for watching see you next time W. Christian wrote. Uh, he didn't write that.